Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming on my Ask Me Anything. You know, I love doing these, right? Um, I got a lot of really good pre-submitted questions tonight. So normally the way this goes is like I try to do the pre-submitted questions and then shit starts happening in the comments that like is too good and that distracts me. And then I get the sidetracked and like the whole thing sort of falls apart. But um, if you are a YouTube member or a Patreon subscriber, then I guarantee that I'll address your question. So that's sort of what like pulls me back on track. Like, look at this guy. Look at this person. Look at Matthew Averill. He just he just became a YouTube member. Hello, Matthew. Thank you for joining my thing. That that means that he like pays. It's not like that he subscribed. Anybody can subscribe. This guy's like now paying money to YouTube, which means um, he gets like a little thing next to his name, and it also means that I'm obligated to respond to every single one of his questions. So, uh, Matthew, you have the power to derail this entire live stream and I'm powerless to stop you. Something to think about. Um, okay. So hi everybody. Thank you for being a part of this. I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to just like get right into it and start answering some of the good pre-submitted questions, but I love what happens in the chat. So feel free to, um, you know, just wreck everything by throwing out some good chat questions. Okay. Let's go, let's go right into it. Um, Hi, thanks for the live stream. You're welcome. I love doing these. It's my pleasure. Thanks for being a part of it. Um, uh, all right. Okay. All right. Um, let's go. Let's go. I'm gonna I'm gonna dive right into a um a pre-submitted question that I think is fun. If you this is from Razark. Um, oh no, wait, look, look, Matthew's got a question and he wants to get right that right out there anyway. All right, hurry up, dude. Hurry up. Um while you formulate your question, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this from Roz Ark. Um, if you had the chance to collab with any band at any point in history, what would it be? This is a fun one. Um, I'm assuming that like collab means that like I can actually maybe like pitch songs, right? Like I'm assuming that if like the way this question is worded is that it's like the fun version of this where like if I come into the rehearsal and I'm like, Hey guys, I thought this could be cool. I don't get instantly fired for saying that. <laughs> like I'm assuming that's part of this. So that being the case, um, nine inch nails came to mind. I, I would love to just sort of like have Robin Fink's job in that band or not even replace him, just work alongside him as like a guitar player, but as also just a sort of like, member of the sonic brigade like just someone who's like making noises um you know at nine inch nails comes to mind they're a huge influence i love them and i also i like the way they adapt their material live uh you know i've seen their show i love their show i like the way they sort of combine um electronic and acoustic elements live i like the way they're sort of like you know they stretch stuff a little bit um Oh, look at this. Does anyone else hear a high pitch frequency in the audio? Maybe, dude, you went from like having my favorite comment to having my least favorite comment where you're like, thanks for doing this live stream. Yeah, I love doing this. Thanks for being thankful to like complaining about high pitch frequencies. I'm not going to address this unless like literally 10 more people complain about it. Yes, a high pitch squeal. For real? For real? That's an issue? I'm using the same setup I do on every single one of these. You know what I might try though? Um, I might try tell me if this better i just unplugged my computer so i'm not going into power anymore um tell me if this fixes it i would i would really love to just be told that that fixes it all right i tried to fix it um okay yeah enough people have addressed the fact that he's right that i'm now going to take it seriously okay cool cool um now it's bad i fixed it i i just unplugged my computer all right great cool 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 thank you thanks for helping me everybody i appreciate it um Okay. All right. What was I saying? Yeah. So Nine Inch Nails comes to mind. Um, you know, I, that would be fun for me. And, but another band I was thinking about that could be fun was Thin Lizzy. I love Thin Lizzy. I feel like I wouldn't be doing a lot of crazy bullshit in terms of like the pedals and effects. You know, I would only be a guitar player, but I feel like I could do it. I think I can play guitar in the Thin Lizzy style. I love Thin Lizzy. And I sort of feel like my time would be like, right when gary moore left like when they got snowy in there nothing against snowy 
I think he's a good guitar player and I like some of the snowy songs. I like um, Killer on the Loose. I like Hollywood. But, you know, that was the moment where it was like, does Thin Lizzy still have it? And I feel like maybe if it's not just totally gross and pretentious for me to say this, I feel like maybe I could have come in there with some like young guy energy and be like, Thin Lizzy still has it, all right? Thin Lizzy still has it. Um, the part that scares me is like whether I would become a heroin addict. I'm a little worried about that because my understanding is that this is when like Scott and Phil were really starting to do stuff. So I, I hope I hope that part wouldn't go bad for your old pal, but that's what came to mind. Okay, look at this dude. I have to answer all this guy's questions because he became a YouTube member. Have you heard Kim Gordon's new record, The Collective? I haven't. I haven't heard it. Judge me how you will for that. I, I don't know anything about it. I'm sorry. Um, how should someone who's never listened to Thin Lizzy get into them? That's a cool question. Um, well, uh, Jailbreak was the record that has like their hits. <laughs> and by hits, I mean the boys are back in town. And then sort of the song Jailbreak, which I guess was like barely not even really a hit, but I do hear that on classic rock radio sometimes. Jailbreak is a really cool record. It's got some of the like macho early heavy metal stuff. It's also got the sort of like romantic sort of like tough guy, but not really tough because you can tell that he's like sort of a sweetie underneath it all. But there's this like flirtatious leather jacket energy coming off of Thin Lizzy that I love. Um, so Jailbreak is like a good, it gives you everything. It gives you like the, you know, the the fake tough guy stuff and the sort of like romantic softy stuff um they also have a live record that like gives you sort of everything and the live record is from like the classic lineup thin lizzy live dangerous that it's just like a lot of the songs that you should know as a thin lizzy fan are on that um and then also they had a record with gary moore uh called black rose that's pretty cool that's that's probably my favorite gary moore record ever actually gary moore is a great guitar player but i think the coolest songs he ever played on were the thin lizzy songs um so thank you for that question i love that question um okay cool 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 what's your favorite nine inch nails record um you know probably the fragile probably the fragile but i i love a lot of them um and i i love some of the later stuff too i love the slip i think that's the one that had discipline that came out in like 2007 i mean not that that was recent but um i think the slip is like a really cool later nine inch nails record it's not that long it's kind of tight it goes a lot of places um obviously i love pretty hate machine and downward spiral i like some of the songs on with teeth i have a soft spot for with teeth I mean, I don't, there's probably no Nine Inch Nails record I don't like, but I guess my favorite is Fragile. All right, cool. Um, okay, here's another one from someone who's like either a, a Patreon guy or a YouTube guy. I had to answer this one. Um, any Latin fusion you do like, does Return to Forever count? Um, this question is because... I spent a significant amount of time talking shit about Carlos Santana on my last Ask Me Anything. That's where this question comes from. I, and I criticized him for a bunch of reasons, but one of the criticisms was that I thought his like treatment of his fusion of rock music and Latin jazz was like kind of simplistic and generic. That's why now people are asking me, is there any Latin fusion you actually do like? This question was terrifying. In fact, I'm only putting it on the screen because I'm a man of my word and the guy who submitted this question joined my Patreon, so I have to do it. Or like two hours ago, I was asking my friends for like Latin jazz wrecks. I was like, guys, I'm so fucked. People are asking me about Latin jazz I actually like, and now I gotta answer this question because I was going so hard on Carlos Santana last time. Um, oh, you know, maybe today's the day we find out that like, Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. You know what I mean? Like may maybe I don't have anything smart to say about this. Does Return to Forever count? Look, I don't I don't even know. I, I'm not a huge Return to Forever fan. The little that I've heard, I sometimes I thought was cheesy. My dad had a Return to Forever record where they did some like Renaissance classical music shit. And I was just like, come on. <laughs> But I revisited it today because I was so afraid to answer this question. And I heard a live version of um, 
Green Dolphin suite that I liked. So, <laughs> so just out of desperation, I'm saying, yeah, Return to Forever counts, and I like them fine. <laughs> okay, now look at this guy. Um, thanks for your money. Thanks for your 199. AC30 pairs to which 412 speaker cab? Thanks, but dude, I'm so sorry that these questions are terrifying. Guys, I'm so sorry. I, I, I talk a big game with my ask me anything. I say that I love doing them. You know, I do I do like two hours. You know, I open it up to the chat. Like anybody can ask me anything. I try to keep it real with you guys, but like I knew this day would come where like you guys are just gonna have questions that I that I, I don't know the answers to. I don't know. I don't know. AC 30 pairs to which 412 speaker cabs. Dude, I don't know. I'm so sorry. I, I mean, I would just say do the conventional choice. I, do, I Normally in my YouTube videos, I'm saying like, don't do the conventional thing. That's like my whole fucking thing is I'm saying don't do the conventional thing. But the AC 30 is a good sounding amp. Um, and it usually sounds good, right? So just like whatever ACDC did, just follow them. And I'm not saying like then continue to make conventional choices like you can start fucking shit up as soon as you plug the thing into the thing i'm just saying in terms of like making a basic amp sound good you, you probably don't need to overthink this and you probably don't need to work very hard like ac30 is going to sound good if you just do the normal thing I, I don't know what the normal thing is i've never owned an ac30 i just use the iridium the strymon iridium pedal in a box amp in a box pedal that has like a, a vox amp in it and that's what i use so i never have to worry about shit like this um what's your favorite fuzz pedal any of the ones in my fuzz video i just recently i put out a fuzz video that like did well any of the fuzz pedals in that video are my favorite fuzzes they're all i think they're all amazing i had fun making that video it was hard for me to choose um <clears throat> Okay. All right. Cool, 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 cool. Um, no, I'm pretty sure ACDC used some, I think ACDC used some AC thirties. I, I know they like are known for using Marshalls, but maybe I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure there was like some Vox shit happening back there. I mean, we can Google it. You know, if I'm really definitely wrong, then you can let me have it. But I, I think there was some ACDC Vox shit happening. I'm pretty sure. Um, Look at this guy. Thank you, Guitar John. Al Nico speakers are probably bad. I'm sure this guy's right. Thank you for coming forward with like a good answer. It's going to be a lot of bad answers today, so I hope you stick around. Guitar, you're you're the guy, okay? I'm going to talk shit and give bad answers, and Guitar John, <laughs> you got to stay. You're going to be the guy who has to give good answers now. Um, all right, cool, 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 cool. I, I'm loving all these stuff in the comments. You guys are asking me about a lot of specific pedals. The answer is either I'm sure it's good or I don't know. Most of the pedals that I have at this point, I've already made videos about, and the videos that are coming out next are going to be more about stuff like reverbs in general or like overdrive in general. Um, dude, it's too late for that. I don't claim to be an expert. Ha ha, shut the fuck up, dude. You know, you came in with the Al Nico. You used the word Al Nico. That was the moment you became an expert. You can't walk it back now. There's no half measures in cyber tech world. You're, I'm declaring you the expert. You're just getting started. Um, okay. Whew. Uh, all right, cool. I got to get through some of the more of these pre-submitted ones that are pretty crazy. Look at this. Look at this question. This is an example of a non-terrifying question that I love. Um, here's a real fast one. Do you edit your own videos? Yes, I do. Thank you. I have help from my friend, John Marty and a friend of mine, Griff Maloney. He gives me some of the drone footage, but it's basically, they, they shoot some of it for me. Like John does the action figures and they have drones. So sometimes I like just grab their B roll drone footage, but I edit and it, I turn it into what it ends up being. Um, what has been the most challenging vid you've made to date it's about the electron octa track that's like a sampler like audio mangling workstation thing that i that thing is very complicated i never had one i got one for making a video it took me a long time i was intimidated by it that that was it's easy for me to answer that question it's the electro electron octa track how's your day going roscoe's raps roscoe's raps i remember you i always love your questions but this is question all i never know what the fuck is going on with people who ask me this 
how's your day going? You're cool, Roscoe's Raps. I know you're cool. But somebody always shows up and asks me this, and I never understand. Like, what is the intention with a question like this? You know what I mean? Like, I, I genuinely don't understand. Like, what, what would you, what, like, if I said, well, it's fine, is that interesting? You know what I mean? If I said, well, it's going bad, it's like, then what are you going to do, right? What if I told you, like, actually, I'm having a fucking terrible day, and instead of talking about all this guitar shit that we were supposed to talk about, now I'm just going to tell you about how I had to go to the DMV, like, and it sucked, you know? Like, are you going to make me feel better? Like, this, I just don't understand, like, what this question leads to. Sorry, bro. I was just wondering. Yeah, I don't mean to attack you. You're cool, dude. I know. I've seen you on these before. You're cool. It's fine. Um, okay. Because it's ask me anything. Oh, right. Someone always says this too. Okay. Here's the, here's the rule. You can ask me anything and I can reply with anything. That's the whole show. Okay. Yeah. I know you can ask me anything. I know that's what the video says. I, I titled the video. I know you can ask me anything. I can respond with anything, right? If I have a problem with your question, I'm going to let you know. That's the rules. That's the whole game. In fact, I have a banner about it because it comes up so much. You can ask me anything and I can respond with anything. Um, oh, are you going to release some of your covers, the strokes to the buscocks? Thank you. Um, some of the some of why the covers in the little pedal video sound so good is that I only really have to do it for like 60 to 90 seconds. You know, I actually I honestly don't know how interesting the buscocks cover would be if it had to be the whole thing. You know, you, you can make stuff sound good if you're just in and out. Um, so I, I think my little covers benefit from the fact that like they're short and it's like, have I heard this before? Oh, I have heard it before. Oh, it's a Buzzcocks cover. Like there's sort of that gimmick to it that I think makes them seem even more cool than they are. You know, I, I, I'm not sure if like putting a three minute, if I'm not sure if converting every single one of those fun ones into like a full length cover would be a satisfying that said i do like putting covers on my albums there's a tom petty cover on um my first cyber attack record there's going to be a cover on the next one too probably elvis presley and those tend to be pretty different so i like doing it um i like doing one per album that's my answer to this are you and emily Hopkins going to collaborate again yes absolutely yes we're bffs in real life um okay cool sorry I, I, I like set up this question before that I said I was excited to address and then I didn't address it. I just started complaining about shit. Here's the question I said I wanted to address. I've had your album on repeat for a few weeks now. Thank you, Justin Spam. Are you working on any new material? I am. I'm working on a second record. Um, it's taken me a long time because I'm right in the phase where it's like, what do I do if I hate this? <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about? You guys ever make an album? And you get to the phase where you're like, what if I hate myself and my own material? You know, I'm, I'm currently battling through that. Most of the basic tracks are done, but there's like two or three where I have to decide like whether to start over and rearrange it or whether it's good. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm like, I'm battling that. But the good news is that um, while you're waiting for that to come out, you should just stream this band called Farmer. Okay, I put a link to Farmer in the video description. If you don't know what Farmer is, it's a brand new project. It's the core band is my friend Jeff Taylor and Jeff Stanfield. Stanfield is like my producer. He produced the first CyberTech record. He's producing the next one. He and my buddy Jeff Taylor started a band and they got a bunch of people to play on it. I'm one of them. I play a lot of guitar and a lot of synthesizer um, on the first record by this band called Farmer. But some of the other people who played on it are also exciting and cool. Um, Mark Giuliano plays drums on a couple songs. The drummer Maroon 5 plays on a couple songs. T um, Tim LaFave played bass. Dave Matthews sings on one song. It's like a super cool lineup of surprising musicians doing a lot of cool stuff. I'd love to be a part of it. If you want to, if you're here because you're a guitar player and you like my YouTube bullshit and you want to go straight to the songs that have my like YouTube bullshit guitar style, I have a solo on a song called Lefty where I like kind of shred. It it's like, sort of in your face it doesn't sound like a guitar but you'll know it's me and i have a guitar solo in a song called fred meyer parking lot called 911. it's right at the end of that song and there's some like glitchy shredding in there too so while you're waiting for um the next cyber attack record to happen just listen to farmer listen to farmer anyway even when the next cyber attack record comes out you should continue listening to farmer the link is 
in the video description. Does your right ear exist? It does. It does, but look, that's not my good angle. That's my angle, you see? If you guys, here's advice to anyone who wants to start a YouTube channel, you gotta know your angles. And I know mine, this is my angle. See, look how much worse I look like that. See how terrible that is? I remember I was playing in my friend Blake's show once a few years ago. And uh, the opening act was this um, like dancer named Salem. And afterwards we all posed for a picture and Blake's manager took it. It was us and Salem. And the manager just took the picture and was like, oh, Salem knows our angles. It was like Salem and then me and the other guys in my friend's group. And I just remember thinking like, okay, Salem knows our angles. I'm assuming that means like, I look like shit in this picture. And then I was like, I should, I should know that. How come I don't know that? How come I don't know my own angles? This was years ago. So then I went home and looked in the mirror and made some hard decisions about myself. Um, your use of Stevie Wonder songs is what made me subscribe to your channel. Who introduced you to Stevie Wonder and why is Intervision so awesome? I love Stevie Wonder. Um, I guess it was my dad. I mean, it was either the radio or my dad. I think I remember hearing uh, Higher Ground on the radio as a kid, and it just like blew my mind, the song Higher Ground. I, I must have heard it on like CBS FM or something. And I was just like, what is this music? This is like the most unreal shit I've ever heard in my life. And my dad was like, yeah, that's Stevie Wonder. My, my, my dad was a Stevie Wonder fan. He'd like seen him in concert in the 70s and stuff. So my dad was like, yeah, correct. Yes, Stevie Wonder is amazing. So then we went to the CD store and I bought Musiquarium um, and just that began like a lifelong uh, admiration and respect for Stevie Wonder. Do you hear any difference in quality between digital and physical pedals? No, I don't. Um, some digital pedals might sound worse than some phys some analog pedals. I'm not saying that like they're equally good, but I don't think the problem with digital pedals is that they're converting your analog signal to digital and back. I don't think that's the problem. If they sound bad, I just think it's because pedals sound bad sometimes. I mean, not every design is going to be as cool as every other design, but whether the design is analog or digital at this point, I think is irrelevant. And I highly doubt that anyone is hearing digital sampling errors. Again, you, you might not like digital pedals. That's fine. It's okay not to like pedals. But if you don't like a digital pedal, I think that's just you don't like it for any of the reasons why you wouldn't like an analog pedal either. You just don't like the way it sounds. I, I highly doubt that what you're hearing and the thing that you don't like has to do with um, the, the conversion to analog and digital and back. Those, those conversions have gotten good. Um, <clears throat> okay, all right, cool. Let's keep going. Here's a here's a fun or submitted pre-submitted one I got ahead of time. Um, this is from Matthew Davis. This was submitted ahead of time. Do you think Jackson Brown is underrated and should be thought of as one of the greatest American songwriters? Um, the the answer is no. No, I don't think he should be considered underrated, and I don't think he's one of the greatest American songwriters. I like Jackson Brown. I like him. I have Running on Empty. I like that album. You know, I get it. I like the songs he wrote for Nico. I think those are cool. I like the stuff he did with Glenn Fry and the Eagles. I like Jackson Brown. I just don't think he's underrated. We're talking about someone who's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame here and has sold like something like 20 million records. So, like, how could he be underrated? You know what I'm saying? Like, what in your mind, what would it look like for him not to be underrated? We got to put his face on the fucking $20 bill. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's literally in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Like, I think he's doing fine. You know, he's got a greatest hits compilation out there. You know, people like him. He sold a lot. He made a lot of money. So I, I don't think he's underrated. I, I, I like he's had as good a career as anybody's had. Um, and then in terms of being one of the greatest American songwriters, I mean, I just, I just don't think so. I mean, I think like, um, I like him and I think he's good, but I don't think he's like unbeatable, you know? I mean, like Stevie Wonder, for instance, I think is like significantly better than Jackson Brown as a songwriter and as a, as like a, as a anything. Uh, that said, I, I like Jackson Brown. I guess, you know, my issue the, the only reason I don't think he's the greatest is that like there is a sort of 
maudlin sort of self-pitying thing that creeps in sometimes. I'm sorry. I, I know he mean, I'm sure he means a lot to you. I'm assuming, I'm assuming you asked me this question because in your mind he's underrated and you think he's one of the greatest American songs. I mean, there's just like no reason to ask this question unless you think that. <laughs> um, but I, I just think there's like a, there's a kind of like, there's like a very specific boring tempo that like Jackson Brown is hooked on. There's just this like very specific tempo and feel where it's just like, oh, this. You know, now we're doing this. And like Jackson Brown like can't get over it. You know what I mean? Like his version of these days is at that tempo. I like Nico's version of these days. And I sometimes I've even like heard that Jackson Brown played guitar on that, in which case like he's shredding. Whatever, like that finger picking arpeggiation shit. If Jackson Brown played that, that dude can shred. I wish he did that on his own material. The Jackson Brown version of these days is like so dull, you know, or like the loadout. This he wrote a song that's like dedicated to his roadies, but he's just like kind of feeling sorry for them. And I don't think it's good. It's like right at the end of Running on Empty, the album. He, then he like trots out this song where he just feels sorry for his own roadies. There's a lyric in there where he's like, he mentions the fact that they work for minimum wage. And I genuinely wonder what his roadies think when they got to like stop what they're doing and look and watch this part of the show where Jackson Brown talks about how hard they work and how little credit they got. You know, the Grateful Dead made their roadies partners. Right. They they didn't have to write a song about how sad it is that their roadies worked for minimum wage. They they made them partners. So I, I wonder sometimes like how much that song is really worth. Um that might sound harsh. I like Jackson Brown. I think Running MD is a cool song, a cool record, but I just like every time I listen to that record, there's that moment at the end when the self-pitying roadie song gives way to stay. He covers stay, like the golden oldies, and all of a sudden it's like fun again. You know what I mean? Like that record ends with this like classic up-tempo pop song, you know? And I was just like, can you hear the difference between your material and this? You know, can we spend a little more time on this side of it? So anyway, if I mean to compare him to like other piano-based American songwriters, I think Stevie Wonder is better. Um, I like him more than Billy Joel. I hope that makes you feel better. I like him more than Billy Joel. Um, you know, there's even like, excuse me, there, like if we're going to talk about piano based songwriter singer guys, I even think I might like Daryl Hall more than Jackson Brown. If we're being real here. I mean, Daryl Hall seems like a much less pleasant person. You know what I mean? I, I don't think I would be friends with Daryl Hall. And I feel like I could be friends with Jackson Brown. What kind of asshole couldn't be friends with Jackson Brown? But I think Daryl, I think I like Daryl Hall's best songs better than Jackson Brown's. And also, like whoever played the beginning of You Make My Dreams, I think it was Daryl. Like there's a verb to that playing. There, there's like a a rhythmic hipness to whoever's playing the keyboard on You Make My Dreams that Jackson Brown, I think, doesn't get to enough. I found out that the keyboard used for the beginning of You Make My Dreams is this sort of rare Yamaha electric keyboard. It's like not a synth. It's like an electric keyboard called the Yamaha CP30. It's When I say it's rare, um, I mean that it like doesn't have its own Wikipedia article about it. So that's how rare it is. I, I found one. I bought one recently. I'm going to make a YouTube video about this. Um, okay, cool. Uh, all right. Okay. I, this was one of those questions where I like talked about it for a long time. And then like the, um, you know, the chat like developed all kinds of new things and like the chat culture evolved and I missed it. Um, oh, okay. All right. Uh, all right, cool. I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep moving. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I missed your questions. Oh, there's also where's David Somerville? He asked me. He always asks questions about my practice routine. So let me let me hit that up. He's always that guy's always here. I know you're out there, David Somerville. I didn't forget about you, my man. Um, I'm interested in a guitarist's daily routine as to what they focus on. I'm sure you're always investigating new horizons. You know, I'm at a point here. Um, uh 
Oh, wait, sorry. Let me, I'll get back to you, but let me just address this. I love what you said about drugs being a pedal board for the mind. That shit really clicked. I'm glad. I'm glad. I mean, it really, it holds up, right? I mean, you can sort of like do the math yourself, but like it really, I think that really is what it is. Um, <clears throat> okay. All right. Uh, but I'll also just say for me, the other part of this is that it's always been important for me to play straight. You know, like I've always tried to be the sort of guitar player where like if you took the pedals away, I could do it, you know, like early when I said I wanted to be in Thin Lizzy, like that was sort of me imagining that, you know, like no more pedals. Um, and and I, I feel the same way about it. That's why I stopped doing drugs. I wanted to be able to like have the thoughts and like have the imagination um, without without the drugs. But I, like I said, in the other ask me anything, that doesn't mean that I became um I'm not like moralistic about it. You know what I mean? There's a lot of ways to be creative and I think everybody should do whatever works the best for them. Um, all right. Uh, okay. Let me get back to the practice question. Um, okay. So I, I, I'm at a point now where like, I don't have a practice routine. You know, I I've got like work I got to do. So the, I just practice whatever shit I got to be able to play. If it's like, if I decide that I want to like, you know, put the solo for bohemian rhapsody in a pedal video then like i'm practicing bohemian rhapsody you know what i mean if i if i said that like i want to cover you know a lizzo song for a youtube video then i'm like figuring out the chords to a lizzo song and coming up with an arrangement or if i got hired to play in something or if i'm like about to track my record or if i'm like co-writing with somebody like the, the shit i practice is just based on whatever i need to play in the near future um, so I'm like always sort of frantically just trying to prepare for whatever professional shit I got to do. Um, I did have a practice routine in an earlier phase of life though, that it's when I was like a teenager in a college. Um, and I was lucky in that I had a good guitar teacher, you know, I just practiced whatever he told me to practice. Um, but I realized this, this might be a sort of unsatisfying answer for you. So I, I guess I'll just say this. Um, I, mean, I mean, for one thing, I, you know, I do give guitar lessons over Zoom. So like if you want a guitar teacher, we'll tell you what to practice. You know, we can we can do it over Zoom. I, I do teach. I, I have a link to this in my video description. So if you if you really want to just do this, find the link in my video description, fill out my form, get in touch. You know, we can do it. Um, but since this is not ask me anything for the sake of like having an answer, um, uh, I would say like, you know, the key to sounding good as a guitar player is like, you got to be able to play in time. <laughs> I don't, I, I, it's like harder than it sounds. Like if you hear me say like, you've got to be, you've got to be able to play in time to sound good. If you hear me say that and the first thing you think is like, well, I can do that. Let's hear what the next thing is. I don't think you really get it yet. If you hear me say that and you think to yourself like, you know, that is sort of like a big deal, then I feel like you get it. And if you're like, oh, that's hard, but I can do it. I can do it, but it was hard. And like, I know what he means. Th then I could maybe believe that you can do it. But if you just think like, yeah, 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 I know playing in time, that's important. If, if that's like what you said to yourself just now, when you heard me say that, I think you, you probably aren't there yet. I don't mean that like, you can play the hardest thing you know how to play at whatever BPM. I mean, like being able to choose what side of the beat you want to be on or not be on either side. I'm talking about like having a relationship with the tempo. You know what I mean? If like, this is the song, <laughs> See, I can't even tap in time. Those like first four, those first four snaps were bad. I don't know if anybody caught that, but I started snapping and it was bad. <laughs> there was like no tempo there for the first three. That's so funny. <laughs> Now, if you didn't catch that, if you thought that snapping sounded fine to you, that's an example that you got to work on your time a little bit better, right? If, you, if you're like, that sounded fine to me just now, it means you got to practice your time a little better. But what I mean here is like, if you have a tempo, let's pray that I have a tempo. If you have a tempo, you know, there's always like three places to be. You can be right on it and that's cool. You know, it's probably not going to sound bad. You can be a little bit behind it which is sort of cool. You could also be ahead of it. Now I used to think that being ahead of it never sounds good. 
I've come to realize that's actually not true. It's the hardest to sound good ahead of the beat, but you can sound good ahead of the beat. Slayer, I think. I've always liked Slayer, but in the last few years, I realized that like one of the things that makes them cool is that they're a rare example of like being ahead of the beat in a way that I think is like juicy and right and not just bad. But um, having a sense of time doesn't just mean you can be on the beat. It means you can control whether you're ahead of it or behind it. Um, and you can choose to do shit with it. So if you're not good at that, you know, try practicing that. Now you might be saying, well, how do I, how do I practice that? There's a guy named Sean Driscoll who I've taken some guitar lessons from. Um, he's got YouTube videos about this. So you just look those up. Type into YouTube, Sean Driscoll metronome stuff and watch his videos. He, he's going to help you more than I could. And if you're in New York, you should just get in touch. That's what I did. He's a great guitar player and a great teacher. He's a cool guy, Sean Driscoll. Okay, aside from time, the trick to sounding good is like, um, you know, being able to like choose the note, you know, having a relationship with notes. And, and most people do this by like understanding scales, not just learning scales, but understanding scales. If you have a really great ear, you can sort of do it without the scale. You can just do it by hearing the note and choosing the note. But if that was your gift, you, you probably wouldn't be asking me questions like this on a live stream. And also that was never my gift either. So I don't feel bad. Um, anyway, th that's, I think, I, so I would say, what should you practice? If, if you don't feel like you have the kind of relationship with time that I described, try to practice that. And if you feel like you don't have the kind of relationship with notes and, and like how to pick a note to play, how do you pick a note to play, right? If I give you a chord progression, right? If, if we're just jamming on like B minor seven, C major seven, C sharp, diminished seven, D sus four, you know, how do you choose what to play over that? Um, if, if you don't know how to choose notes over that, um, ask your guitar teacher why you don't know how to do that. And if, and if he doesn't give you a good answer, then find a new guitar teacher. Um, and if you feel like you can play over that progression, but you're not really choosing the notes yet, you're just sort of playing the tricks, you know, then it's time to look at the tricks, you know, and like try to be able to hear the notes before you play them and like try to get good at listening to that inner ear and making decisions based on that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. All right. Cool. 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 Again, that was another one where I spent a bunch of time on it and then like I missed all the I missed all the shit that happened in the chat since then. Guys, I'm sorry that like the chat culture is so strong. You know what I mean? You, you guys have like the hive mind is so good, but I feel like I, I've like, been neglecting you. I want to apologize for that. I'm sorry. I miss you. I love you. Um, okay. All right. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, oh, here's one. Oh, look at this. Jeff caught it. <laughs> You're talking about the snaps, right? You're talking about how my snaps were bad. <laughs> Dude, every time I ever do anything like that, I'm like, if Jeff is watching, if Jeff's around, if Jeff's around, Jeff will catch it. Jeff is my friend and is also the keyboardist of Cyber Attack. Jeff, Jeff is like, Jeff was my freshman roommate in college. We're BFFs, but he's also a member of the Cyber Attack band. He's on the first record. If you've been to the shows, he's in the show um that's so funny you caught that my snaps were bad jeff is the kind of person where like anytime i'm like i try to sing a major seventh and it doesn't sound good i'm like fuck jeff caught that probably that's so funny and of course you got to type it in the chat too of course jeff here's my question for you have you been lurking this whole time and that was the first thing you typed what a friend yep it is oh no here he is here he is here he is What's your favorite concert you've ever attended? Cool, cool, cool. I was a bit, Jeff, I was about to go hard on you for being my friend and not saying a single fucking thing in the chat until I fucked up. I was about to nail you for that. But look at this. You had a sweet little question like half an hour ago. What's your favorite concert you've ever attended? Um, cool. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Nine Inch Nails comes to mind at the PNC Art Center in New Jersey. You know, I'm, I'm sorry that I just talk about Nine Inch Nails all the time, but I really, that was a great concert. Um Oh man, who else? I I don't know. I I really I don't know. They were all pretty good. I saw a cheap trick at Irving Plaza. I've seen them a bunch of times, but I saw them at Irving Plaza and like two of the guys in Jellyfish opened for them. It was um Jason Faulkner and Roger Manning. And 
they did like a duo set and then they were like the side musicians for cheap trick they like rounded up like roger was playing keyboard and jason was playing extra guitar um and it was the only time i'd seen cheap trick where they had like other musicians on stage and I, that was pretty cool i mean i like cheap trick as a four piece but it was cool hearing them with the extra stuff and those jellyfish guys like they didn't just make shit louder they were like really sort of covering some bases in a way that was cool um okay cool 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 uh any stop motion advice that's funny um my friend does the hard part my friend john marty does the hard part so we should ask him i, I should tell him he's got to start being part of these um i mean i do stop motion he does it all in front of a green screen or like in a green box so like it, he only does the action figure and there's no background or there's no context. And then I find the backgrounds and that makes it a lot easier because I can like reuse the same animation of Chun-Li dancing, you know, but if I put her in like a parking lot, that looks like one thing. And then if I put her in a level from, you know, Ocarina of Time, that looks like a different thing. So, you know, that makes it a lot easier. Um, Okay, cool, cool. Hire a guy. Yeah, yes, right. Yes. That I mean, that's what I did. You know, it makes it a lot easier. Hire a guy. I mean, I, I guess I will say this. If you do the thing where you just have to find the backgrounds, there's a lot. There's a lot of backgrounds in the world, you know. I mean, you can see what I do. Like I take screen recordings of Google Maps. I screen record myself playing video games and use those backgrounds. I don't just play the video game. I like play the video game in a way where I'm trying to get the background. You know what I mean? I'm not like trying to get the big Goron sword. I'm like trying to stand in the exact right place in Lake Hylia so I can like get the sunset. Um, you know, uh, you can go to Spriter's resource. If you don't, if you don't know what that website is, go to Spriter's resource and then you're just going to be like, Oh, this is how cyber attack makes his videos. <laughs> if you've never been to that website, it's going to blow your mind. Um, huh, okay. Uh, what do you use to stay motivated and continuously improve your skills? Also, what's your favorite thing you've learned recently? You know, stay motivated. I mean, I, you know, my motivation goes up and down, you know, like I'm struggling to finish my next record. You know, I have to like figure out which of those songs need to be reimagined and which of them are good. And I'm just, I've heard it too many times. So, I guess I would say um, don't panic just because your motivation goes down a little bit. Like try to try to develop a mindset where you can like be unmotivated and like feel a little sad about it and not abort the whole project. Like th that's my number one advice to any person trying to do anything in music or YouTube or whatever is like, get tough enough so that you can just sort of have it go badly for a while and not give up you know there's a big difference between kind of just like taking hits for a while but not giving up and like quitting you know i mean if you have to quit for your mental health then okay i'm not judging that but i'm just saying like don't quit just because your motivation ran out like give yourself a chance to recover how do you recover i mean look i don't know i i, I don't you know, I, I've, I've had this sort of macho dysfunctional thing my whole life where it's like, you can't give up. You know what I mean? I was on the cross country team in high school and it was just like, you can't start walking. You know, you can run slow if you get tired, but you can't start walking. I mean, that was just considered a disgrace. They were like, look, if we're not, if, if you, if you have a bad race, that's one thing, but like, you just keep running. You know what I mean? Like run as slow as you would walk if you have to, but don't walk. So from day one, I was just like, well, you can't, I, I might not be motivated to do my music shit today, but I'm just going to force myself to do something. But in my case, you know, I also have all these like YouTube deadlines and shit. You know what I mean? Like I got to make another video. I got to upload a video. So I have a video for next week, you know, like, so sometimes I don't always feel like picking up a guitar and playing, but I still have to edit all that animation and I have to find a bunch of new backgrounds for my stop motion. So I'll do that. If I'm, if I have the blues, you know what I mean? If I'm in a bad day where I don't feel motivated, I'll just like see if I can find a cool new picture of an abandoned mall in Bergen County, New Jersey on Google maps. And if I can find a cool one, then I can use that in a YouTube video someday. And I'll just put that in my folder of like cool pictures of malls. I got to use. 
you know? So, you know, the thing is to like have some aspect of your project that can be the thing you're going to work on when you really feel bad about it, like the, the least stressful version, you know, maybe for you, that would be like figuring out the font. What's the font of your band? I mean, maybe you think that's the most stressful thing in the world, in which case, you know, don't pick that one, but you got to figure out your font. You got to figure out your band logo. You got to figure out your album cover. You got to, you know, there's like being a musician requires all this extra bullshit, you know, and, there's got to be some part of it that you find kind of interesting, even when you hate the rest of it. So figure out what that thing is and then do that on your days when you're suffering and your motivation is taking a hit, you know, and then you spend enough time doing that. You take a break from the other stuff. You, you might be able to like get back on the horse after a couple of days of just doing the other thing. You know what I mean? Um, and then what's the thing you've learned recently? I'm trying to learn how to do blender the 3d animation thing i actually i myself never do 3d animation all the animation shit i do is two-dimensional and premiere um but i'm taking that guy's class what's his name like blender guru there's there's like this guy who's got some cool free youtube videos about how to use blender which is free i'm, I'm taking the free youtube class about how to use the free 3d software um uh so i'm learning that when when i learn that i'll be able to like my animation should get a little bit better i would love to be done learning it though um <clears throat> okay cool 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 uh how would acoustic cyber attack sound like um there's some acoustic guitar on the next record um there's some acoustic guitar on the next record although they're like layers in a larger thing but the answer to what this sounds like is that I have voice memos that are this. Like when I write a song, it's me strumming unplugged. It's not a real acoustic guitar. It's an unplugged electric guitar. It's me like strumming and me singing into my phone to keep the idea. You know, at some point, every time I'm writing a song, I try to write the song only on the level of like, what's the chord progression and the rhythm and the melody? no effects no anything no production like just on that level so i have a bunch of this shit on my phone i think i'm gonna when the next album comes out i think i'm also gonna release the um the voice memos to like my patreon people okay cool um oh here's an amazing question i got i wonder if this guy's still here i was gonna start with this one but then i always get um uh, you know i always get overwhelmed immediately by the comments Okay. Are you more of a lean against a brick wall, fold your arms and spit on the ground kind of guy or more of a stand tall, thumbs through the belt loops, tilt your head to the side and squint kind of a guy? Amazing question. I, yawn, 8974. I, you know, I, I have to give you credit for such an amazing question. This is hard for me. There are elements of both that I love. There are elements of both that I love. Um, I think I'm the first one. I think I'm lean against a brick wall, fold your arms and spit on the ground kind of guy. I think I'm that. But um, <clears throat> the thing about the second one I love is squinting. I love I love a good squint. You know, I, I might pick the second one just because of squinting. Thumbs through the belt loops I don't really relate to. I, I, that's not really, I don't get that. I don't do that. I lean, you know, I lean and I, and I squint. Um, there's a lot of pictures of me on vacation where I'm like this, that, that's like the, that's what my face looks like when I relax. This is how you know that I'm like at peace. You know, like every picture that's ever been taken of me at the beach is like this. You know, I just, I, I like, I, un, I, I feel like on a spiritual level, squinting makes a lot of sense to me. Go to karaoke song, dude. I don't know if you realize, but like karaoke was a huge part of my development as a singer. Um, when I decided to be a singer, you know, you got to practice singing like at real volume. You know, you can't you can't just get good at singing like this in your apartment like an asshole. Like you really got to resonate. Um, so what I ended up doing was instead of like renting rehearsal studios in Manhattan, which is like kind of expensive, I found this karaoke place, me and my friend Lubitz. Um, found this karaoke place that was like cheap during the day you know it was near union square you could go at like 2 p.m and they would like rent you a karaoke private room for like 
three dollars an hour or something so i would go there and then like practice singing by just doing karaoke alone i would i would go to the karaoke place at like 3 p.m it would just be me and like the bartender would be like you know setting up and then i would get this room by myself and then just like sing different karaoke songs alone in that like dark karaoke room it was a vibe it was a vibe. i definitely felt like a lonely psycho i felt like a lone guy that that was the name i gave that version of myself was a lone guy some sometime i'm either gonna write like a album or a song or a memoir or something it's just gonna be called a lone guy that was the name i gave to like that personality that when you just go to a karaoke place at 2 p.m and like sing by yourself in a dark karaoke room um so i got to know like all those weird song fly arrangements and like all those weird stock videos like the karaoke is such a bizarre fucking world um anyway um what do you think the karaoke employees thought was going on yeah good question jeff they they didn't give a shit they, they just like they don't give a shit i mean these are like new yorkers you know what i mean like why are they gonna give a shit I, jeff i don't know if you remember this but we once went to a chuck e cheese in attleboro massachusetts in the middle of the day because we were near one and we were hungry and we were like oh let's go to chuck e cheese and just get the pizza and we thought that was like the funniest fucking thing you know we were in college and we were like these chuck e cheese employees are gonna flip when we as these two college-age knuckleheads walk in and order pizza and eat pizza at chuck e cheese holy smokes this is gonna be crazy do you remember what happened we walked in and ordered a pizza and they just didn't give a shit they're like, okay, medium or large, you know? And then we just had to eat this pizza and Chuck E. Cheese. And like, nobody thought it was a big deal. Like we, we had to come down from the fact that we thought it was going to be a big deal. And it wasn't a big deal at all. That was the vibe at the karaoke place. That was it. They were like, do you want the pitcher of ice water this time? You know, they didn't give a shit. But then the other thing is that in order to like practice singing, like this is why I got out of my apartment is like, I can't be thinking about what the neighbors are hearing. I can't be thinking about that. You know, like as soon as I thought like, oh, I wonder if the guy in 3A is hearing some of this, it's over, you know. So I had to also believe that that was happening with the karaoke. People. I had to be like, they can't even hear this. And if they do, they don't give a shit. Um, the, the, the second you start thinking about it, you're like not practicing anymore. You know, then, then all of a sudden you're like singing to the karaoke cashier. I mean, th that's maybe its own form of training, but you're, but you're not going to like work on stuff at that point at that point it's a performance and that's different than um that's different than working on it um okay so but what was the question what are my karaoke go-to's right well one thing i learned is that like the songs that you wish you could be good at singing are not necessarily the songs you're going to be good at singing or like the songs that you feel like would be your songs are not necessarily your songs you know what i mean I, i'd love to tell you that like it sounds good if I sing We Are the Champions, you know, but weight classes exist for a reason. And I'm not in Freddie Mercury's weight class. You know what I mean? One thing I learned is that like the songs that I can sing are sort of more in the like tough loser quality, like the, the vulnerable tough guy. It's like would never let you see him cry but has suffered you know what i mean like hurt so good by john mellencamp that's like a song i can do in karaoke you know or um there's a bunch of tom petty songs that are like that you know don't do me like that is pro that's probably my number one karaoke go-to is don't do me like that by tom petty um oh yeah here we go i saw this earlier i know todd i know i know we have a tad excuse me tad fat um <clears throat> okay guitar duel this is some new insane format that now i'm gonna have to be dealing with for the rest of my life this is like a new type of question that got invented guitar duel it's eric clapton with a hologram microcosm versus jerry garcia with a chase bliss mood first one to fall asleep loses what's the outcome look i don't fucking know these these questions are so complicated now <laughs> but i you know you're, you're a fucking youtube member so i gotta i gotta do it i gotta give you your due um neither of these guys are my guy you know i i eric clapton i've i've already talked about him you guys can guess what i think about eric clapton jerry garcia i i, I never really got it the grateful dead i i never really got it i'm so sorry everybody i'm so sorry um 
you know, I just feel like if I'm going to listen to music like that, I would just listen to jazz or something. You know, like I, I just feel like pe- people do shit where they like improvise and it's weird, you know, but they do it in a way where it's not just like fucking hippies in a barn the whole time. You know, they do it in a way that's like, cool, it's jazz. Um, so I don't, I've never really got it, but you know, who's like a fucking hardcore Grateful Dead fan is my producer, Jeff Stanfield. We talked about this while I was in a studio making my next record. We had a night, there was this night where we like stayed up late talking about music. It was like being in a sleepover in eighth grade again. And, and I was telling him like, oh, Grateful Dead. I was just like shitting on the Grateful Dead the way I always do. It was like, ask me anything. He probably thought it was annoying that I was just like talking shit. Um, and then he told me, he gave me this whole thing about why Jerry Garcia is cool and why the Grateful Dead are cool and why Jerry Garcia's ability to like summon these melodies that were as out there as they were, but still had a sort of melodic shape and a melodic contour is like brilliant. And he compared Jerry Garcia to Pat Metheny, who I think very highly of, and he did it with a straight face. That didn't convert me, but it made me think that maybe I'm just not hearing it. Like maybe it's there, but I, the issue is me. That's possible. Maybe I'm just, this is my limitation. So uh, for that reason, because of Jeff Stanfield, my producer, then I, I'm going to say that Jerry Garcia wins this incomprehensible battle question. Um, all right, look at this. How do you deviate from the music you like a lot? For instance, I like John Mayer a lot when I hear it. I want to do music like that, but at the same time, don't want to copy. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, I see what you mean. Well, you know, I, I guess the best advice would be to like write a lot of different songs and just try to finish as many as you can. And don't worry about this so much. Worry about this a little bit every time, but just try to finish as many as you can. And the more you write, the more tricks you're going to sort of pick up. And the more you're going to start to be like, oh, you know, what could be cool this time is if I if I combine that weird keyboard sound I got three songs ago, but this time I used it in like a minor key. And like, if you just sort of force yourself to produce enough little songs that aren't that important and you pick up enough weird little tricks and stuff, then you can start to use those. You know, you can write a song that might sound like John Mayer type shit on like the chord level, but you can not use a guitar at all. You can use the instrumentation you used on your like piano thing. You see what I'm saying? Like, I think that's one way to do it. Um, <clears throat> I, I hope that helps. All right, cool. There's some other pre-submitted ones I wanted to do. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This was good. I got a couple questions that were so, that are sort of like the one I just got. Um, how often do you listen to music that's new to you and that has has that evolved over time by made on tape? Um, this is gonna um. This is going to sound a little freaky, but like YouTube is actually kind of part of it in a way. Like at this point, I don't know if that makes it seem like I'm too YouTubed up. Maybe I am. Maybe I'm like too reliant on YouTube for everything. You know what I mean? But but the YouTube recommendation engine has like turned me on to some cool stuff. I discovered Resort Realism through YouTube. That's an amazing band. If you have ever watched two seconds of one of my YouTube videos and liked it, you're going to love the band Resort Realism. You should just look them up. It's like really cool lo-fi, like piano, like keyboard and bass. It's like their whole vibe is that it's like if you went to this like weird lo-fi resort, like if you went to a hotel, there was just some sort of like chiptune hotel and you just lived there. That's what the music is like. It's really cool. So check out Resort Realism. I got them from, um, I got them from, a YouTube recommendation. I also discovered like Madison Cunningham and Ron Gallo through YouTube. I mean, maybe that's weird because like they're famous already. Like maybe it's, maybe I'm unhip because I needed YouTube to introduce me to those people, but I discovered them through YouTube. They were cool. Apart from YouTube, um, some of it is just from like being an active musician in New York. You know, I'm lucky that like my friends are cool musicians. You know, like I play, I mentioned my friend Blake. I'm in his band. I would be a fan of his if I wasn't just his buddy. His artist name is Fusilier. You just look up Fusilier. He's, he's great. Um, you know, or like the band Lorraine or her, that artist, Lorraine. Like the first time I ever saw her was because Blake took me to see her show at Come On Everybody. That's like a small club. You know what I mean? We were like in an audience of like 150 people years ago. And I was like, she's amazing. Um, so some of it is just from being an active musician. That's cool. 
Um, and then sometimes it's YouTube people. Like I got a comment a couple months ago from someone asking me about Brittany Howard. And then I looked her up and she's awesome, you know? So I feel like I'm, a lot of it is just from YouTube for better or for worse. There, there was a while when YouTube was like trying to straight up radicalize me. I'm, I'm glad that's over. This was sort of before the pedal shit. I like watched, I watched like a two hour interview of Evander Holyfield by Joe Rogan. And like, if you watch two hours of Joe Rogan on YouTube, YouTube flips the fuck out. YouTube was like, oh, 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 cool, 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 cool. They were like, Ivan, you know what you should check out? You should just watch every Stefan Molyneux video that's ever been made. And if you don't know who that is, consider yourself very lucky. You know, the thing is that like Joe Rogan's interviewed a lot of people that I've would be interested in watching and some of those interviews are cool you know what i mean like the david lee roth one is cool the mike tyson ones are cool like i'm gonna watch those but at the next like youtube then takes that and like figure tries to decide that like i'm basically timothy mcveigh that's what, like what youtube wanted me to be you know what i mean on january 6th youtube was like ivan you should go to the capitol you know that right you know that's where you belong you know that's the kind of person you are you should go it's gonna be wild like for years, YouTube was just like trying to radicalize me with my up next and my recommendations. It was just like I was seeped in the intellectual dark web. Um, then the pedal shit kind of changed that. Like now YouTube is more like, oh, okay. Okay. All right. Here, here's like a, here's some Josh Scott for you. You know what I mean? It's like not as, I, I sort of escaped the like the Timothy McVeigh the algorithm. Um <clears throat> Okay, cool, 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 cool. Anyway, that's the answer to that. Um, all right, cool. I have some more pre-submitters I have to get through. Oh, yeah, here's, here's a cool one. Um, do you play jazz or use any jazz-informed approaches when composing? From Patrick, how do you say that? Patrick LaDuc music. You know, I think the answer is yes. I think that. But, you know, real jazz musicians probably see my attempts to do jazz and think it's the most, like, Mickey Mouse bullshit. Um, I mean, the truth is that, like, my ability to improvise is not at an all-time high. You know, like, cranking out these YouTube videos and working on my record, which is, like, not an improvisational record. I mean, that both of those things take a lot of time. That is like listening to stuff, making arrangements, playing stuff, recording stuff, overdubbing stuff, making my animations, excuse me, working with pedals, trying to line up the new pedals, trying to line up the new videos. I mean, like if you don't practice improvising, you just don't get good at improvising. I remember the first time I like jammed with somebody after like a year and a half of COVID and I, I thought I sounded so bad. I was like, Jesus Christ. And it's weird because like you don't feel... Like I was playing guitar that whole time. You know, my ear didn't get bad. You know what I mean? I was figuring songs out all that whole time. You know, I think my ear is kind of good. Um, it didn't get worse. But if you just don't practice improvising, um, it's just funny how that slips away. And I, I consider that to be the single most important aspect of jazz. I, I, I mean, I know there's other parts of it, but I consider like, I, I guess I would say that it's impossible to be a good jazz musician if you're not good at improvising. I, I would be surprised if any serious jazz musician disagreed with what I just said. Um, having said that, you know, I love a lot of jazz music and I think I do incorporate like a certain kind of, um, I mean, I think there's some like complicated chords in my stuff, but I try to make it sound good. You know, I, I use some, I use some out there shit. Uh, you know, there's a song on in, on the first cyber attack record called Invincible. I mean, I, I realize that song maybe doesn't sound like jazz, but like that song was written around how cool I think a, a major seven sus two chord sounds. It was just like that song was on a musical level. That song was inspired by just like, what if what if you could just like live inside the vibe of major seven sus two, you know, and like that's you know i consider that to be like jazzy but uh, like you know pg-13 jazz like I, I realize that what i'm saying here is probably like disgusting and offensive to serious jazz musicians on the other hand i did 
perform at this thing in Hamburg, Germany, where I was billed as a jazz hero. There's like this series at this jazz institute in Hamburg called Jazz Heroes. And I was hired to play there and I performed in a jazz trio, two sets in one night. And I was billed as like Ivan Anderson jazz hero. I, I didn't realize that's what, how I was going to be billed until like right before it happened. And I remember saying to my guy who hooked me up, I was like, I don't know if this is a good idea. I don't know if you should call it that. <laughs> um, but I got through it, you know, like people clapped. People seemed to like it. You know, I, I could do my shit. Like I, I did like a little chord melody thing. I improvised, you know, we played some standards. I mean, like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm, not I'm, I'm like, I'm not the first call. You know what I'm saying, but I can do it. I can, I can do it a little bit. There's um, there's a Google spreadsheet I made where I list every single song I've covered in the pedal videos. If you don't know about this, this is like you're gonna make your day. In the video description of this video, I have a link to a spreadsheet where I tell you every single song I'm covering, uh, in every single YouTube video I've ever made. If you didn't know that a lot of those are covers, a lot of them are covers. And the only ones that are not covers are like little demos of the songs that are gonna be on my records. So if you go into that Google spreadsheet and do like a find, like command F, like search, find the word jazz standard, there's a bunch. I've covered a bunch of jazz standards uh, over the course of my YouTube shit. So go into that spreadsheet, search jazz standard, look up all the different jazz standards I've, I've um, I've, uh, covered and listen to those and you can judge for yourself how good you think I am at doing jazz. At one point after my last band broke up before cyber attack, I was in a band with Jeff who's out there somewhere. Jeff, you still here? Um, at when that, that band called sweet fix broke up, I was like sort of depressed and in a low point with my relationship with music. And I was so depressed and I like had a hard time like playing like I didn't want to play because like it just reminded me that I wasn't in a band and that like I didn't have anything going on and like it would seem like my career was done um but the one thing that oh yeah see Jeff okay check this out Jeff hi Jeff Jeff was the keyboardist of that band and was also the keyboardist of cyber attack I I honestly feel like my relationship with jazz was enriched by Jeff thank you Jeff I don't know if I ever told you this but when you joined sweet fix as the keyboardist I, the fact that you like knew as much about jazz as you did that was just like interesting to me at that time and i, I feel like i sort of wanted to learn more because of you um anyway uh why am i talking about this oh yeah 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 anyway so when that band broke up i was depressed jeff didn't give a shit jeff was fine about it but that that band broke up and i was crushed and the the one thing in music that like I thought maybe I could do without being totally sad every second was to take more guitar lessons. I'd always been a good student. I'd always been good at taking guitar lessons and like guitar lessons were like knowable and safe to me. So I called up that guy I was talking about before, Sean Driscoll, and I took some jazz lessons from him. But I also signed up for a jazz improvisation class at the 92nd Street Y, which is just this place in New York that like does night school classes and shit like that. And and they had a class called like jazz improv. So I signed up for this class that was basically just like playing standards with a group of other people who signed up for the class. And that was a fucking experience. Let me tell you, that was an experience. I, it was mostly old men. And when I say mostly old men, I mean that it was entirely old men. It was all old men, except for the guy who led it. The guy who led it was just like an adult. Like, you know, he's probably 50 years old. He played bass. He was like, you know he let it he was good he was like a pro guy he's like a real jazz musician he got all these old guys together they would say like let's play autumn leaves let's play fly me to the moon and this dude would just like call out the changes as they played didn't need the music he would just call out the changes and we would play it and you know i walked in and i was like let's try it you know jazz is interesting to me you know i thought this would be a challenge but the crazy thing about it was that like a week or two into it I like reread the course description or something. I was like trying to find, I don't remember. I had to look up the course after I started the course. And I saw that at the end of the semester, there was supposed to be some kind of performance or something. And no one was talking about that. 
And so the next time I went, I was like, hey, what's the deal with this like performance at the end of the thing? And like all the old men got awkward. It was like clear that I'd said something that was like an issue. Like nobody wanted to answer my question. So I was like, what's the deal here? And then one of the old men was like, normally we let the Wednesday group do that. And I was like, what the fuck is the Wednesday group? And there were two groups. Like the class was so big that there were like two different groups. There was the Monday group. That's the night I came to the class. And then I guess there's this group on Wednesdays too. And they're like, we normally let the Wednesday group play the recital. We, we don't do it. And I was like, why? And they're like, well, you know, those guys do bebop. They don't have a singer. So they can do bebop and shit like that. So after the class, I, I went up to the teacher. I was like, listen, man, can I, can I check out Wednesday? You know, no offense to these guys, but like, if that's the fast lane, like, can I sit in on a Wednesday or something? And he was like, yeah, I put you in here because there's already two guitar players on Wednesday, but you could see it. So I was like, okay. So I go to Wednesday and it's just like different fucking old men. It was just different old men. And like, the fact that they're playing bebop or whatever, like, I didn't think they sounded better than Monday. I'll put it to you that way. Okay. So I went back to Monday and I was like, guys, like, I don't know what you're so afraid of, but like, we can play in the recital. You know what I mean? Like, Wednesday's not better than you. Like, I'm, I'm, I promise you that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we can do this. So I sort of like riled these guys up and I was like, let's go for it. Let's, let's do it. Let's really do it. Um, and then I spent the next like two and a half months, like showing up on Monday night, like trying to find some standards that sounded good, trying to get people fired up for the recital. Um, and then the recital finally came and I could tell people were nervous about it. You know, like these old guys are like getting uptight about like, am I going to have to sing into a microphone? Cause I really prefer not to. And like, you know, they would, he would say to the drummer, like, don't start playing loud. Cause if you play loud, I have to sing into a microphone and they always feed back and it changes. It was just like, you know, these guys are uptight. Um, and I'll never forget it. But like on the night of, uh, the night of the rehearsal, the night of the recital, the night of the show, um, the the worst guy the worst old guy the guy who like always blew it um didn't go he just didn't show up to the recital this was the guy who like just always fucked up in the songs he just didn't tell anybody he wasn't gonna go he just didn't go and it reminded me of the scene in godfather 2 when that guy kills himself <laughs> remember what i'm talking about there was the guy who betrays the family and then he says like look i know what i did was wrong but in the ancient roman days He's saying this to Duvall, the conciliary. He's like, look, like in the ancient Roman days, there would be this thing where like if somebody really dishonored their family, they had this understanding that they could just kill themselves and then their family would be spared as long as they just took the initiative and went off and committed suicide. And then that guy slid his own wrist in the tub in Godfather 2. And I felt like that's what this old guy was doing when he didn't show up to the recital because he knew he was bad. He just like killed himself in a bathtub. So at the recital, um, you know, we Monday night did its thing. I, I, I was trying to say to the guys like, look, like if you guys can just like keep it together, you know what I mean? Like if you can just like follow the form and like don't, don't get ambitious, you know, don't try shit you've never tried before. Drummer, like keep it, don't play so loud that the singer loses his fucking shit. You know, like everybody just fucking play defensive you know what i mean just like play defensive i'll take the solos i'll go for it you know what i mean like i'll fucking hit it out of the park okay and like you guys just don't fuck up and and it'll be good it'll be good um so we that's that was the game plan and we did it and then wednesday did their thing and you know i thought it was pretty clear how the night went and i i wasn't gonna um i, I wasn't gonna like brag or say anything about it but afterwards um, I, I overheard like the teacher and the singer were like carrying the shit back to the class and like trying to push some shit into the elevator. And the singer said something like, you know, I feel like Monday really stole the show for once. <laughs> and I was like, fucking it. We did it guys. We did it. <laughs> so, um, to answer your question, uh, you know, I, as a jazz musician, how good am I? I'm good enough that I could lead a class, a night school class of old men to victory. That's how good I am at playing jazz. Um, 
yeah, I, I do plan to do something with the story. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, I'm going to do shit with it. It's, it's hysterical. Um, cool, 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 cool. So after that class ended, that's when I was like, I got to start a new band though. You know what I mean? Like I, this can't just be my music career. Can't just be that I pay money to, to make these old guys feel good by taking a standards class with them. You know, I, I can't, I, 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 I got to I got to start doing some real shit here. Uh, so somewhere in there is when I uh, started cyber attack. Um, okay, cool. Let's go. <sighs> Let's go into some more pre-submitted questions. Um, here, here's one I'm going to try to bang out. Uh, Kirk or Picard? Kirk or Picard? I, you know, I, I've never watched a lot of Star Trek, but from the little bit that I know, I, I would say Picard. I mean, Picard was my era. I'm not that fucking old. You know what I mean? Like I was, I was growing up with Next Generation. Um, Picard seems cool. You know, Picard seems like a, he's like the 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 benevolent philosopher king. You know what I mean? He's like the smart leader who is good, and it's good that he has total command because he's smart and good. Um, so yeah, I would say Picard. But the guy who could really answer this question is Jeff, my keyboardist. Jeff, you're still here, right? Come up in the comments, show your fucking face, and you tell us who's better, Kirk or Picard. You know, you can have this one. Whatever you say will be the final word. If I'm wrong, if the answer is Kirk, I'll put that on the screen. I'll put it on the kiss cam. You just tell me. Um, you said you use the iridium, the iridium for recording guitar into your computer. Have you ever used any amps and plugins or anything like that? And said, not really. Um, none of the ones I've used, I thought sounded better than the Iridium. I haven't used that many though. Um, yeah, I just think the Iridium is good. So I know that's probably the most boring answer you could have possibly imagined when you typed that question into me, but that's me just telling you the truth. Um, all right. Look at Jeff. I watched all of the next generation, but have barely seen any of the original series. So obviously Picard. Yeah. Okay. Well, you let me down, man. You know, I, 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 I knew that you'd seen more of next generation than the original. I knew that about you, but I was counting on the fact that you would have like read a lot of Wikipedia about original, you know, and that you'd seen like enough original to like have more of an opinion than that. But Okay. All right. If that, you know, I commend your honesty. Um, uh, better to trust your homies to mix when you're starting off or better to invest in having a pro do it. If you can afford the pro, do the pro. I mean, you're going to learn more and it'll sound better. So if you can afford it, just do it. Um, thoughts on upgrading mood Mark one to mood Mark two. I don't have the Mark two. Um, I don't have the Mark II, but my, I still have thoughts on it, I guess. I mean, I don't up, – upgrading the Mood 1 to Mood 2 is not going to solve any of your problems. Upgrading from any pedal to any pedal is, is not going to solve any of your problems. The only problem it could solve is like some very, very basic, specific, obvious thing that you would already know the answer to, okay? Like if you have a need for a delay pedal that can – be BPM specific, like if it would help you to have a delay pedal where you can tell it the, the tempo is 140 beats per in and there's like a die where you can set it to literally 140 BPM. If that's a problem because you need it to be 140 BPM and it's not happening otherwise, then getting the timeline would solve that problem. You see what I mean here? Like the only problems that are solved by upgrading gear are like very straightforward problems like that all other problems are just creative problems and gear has nothing to do with that if you can use gear creatively you can use any gear creatively you can use your own gear creatively i have videos on my channel where i talk about i know i'm the guy who's always telling you about what the shit you can do with the new pedal and i know that i put affiliate links in my videos and that the whole thing is like very consumerist and that even aside from that, I made a whole video series about why like orange juice is beautiful to me and consumerism is beautiful to me. And like walking into a CVS with the lights and the merchandise and the store is beautiful to me. I know that I'm like the most disgusting, like late capitalist shithead of all time. I get it. But 
I felt bad about it for a minute or two. And so I made these videos on my YouTube channel where I tell you how to do stuff without buying any new gear. One of those videos is called how to get the most out of your pedals. And the other video is called how to be creative, extended techniques. Okay. And in those videos, I explain that like, you don't need to buy gear. You don't need to buy the mood Mark two. The mood Mark one is a fucking insane pedal that can do totally bonkers shit. And is totally bananas. And like, you don't need to get gear that's more bananas than that. You've already got the gear that's like super fucking bananas. So um, you have to look inward, my son. I'm sorry if that's harder work, but you know it, it, it is. It is hard work. Like being a musician is hard. Doing anything as a musician is is hard. Maybe other people don't feel that way. Maybe some people feel that like being a musician is vibes, and it should just be like intuitive, and it should just come naturally. You know, th those people might be more successful than me. It's possible. I mean, you might, it's possible you're getting bad advice right now, but you know, there is a part of me that is just still sort of this like macho guy who like just cares about getting on the varsity cross country team more than anything else. And just like wants to do that and have sex and learn how to play guitar. That's it. And like the way that guy thinks is that like, it doesn't matter if it's easy, like, it's okay if it's hard. Sometimes you're going to have to do hard shit, you know, and buying the mood Mark two is like sort of looking for an easy solution. You see what I'm saying? I don't mean to be hard on you, mump Lord. I'm just telling you what I really think. Um, <clears throat> okay, cool, cool, cool. Let me, um, let me get back to some of the pre-submitted ones. Um, how much experience do you have with open or alternate tunings? Very little. This is one of those things where like, I just decided to stay in standard because if you have like infinite choices, it's going to be impossible. And I'm already doing a lot with a lot of pedals, despite all the macho shit I just said a second ago, I, I like have a lot of pedals on my shelf, you know? And if it's like infinite pedals, infinite tunings, like at some point you, it's got to stop being infinite. So I just decided I was going to live in standard tuning world the whole time. Um, I, I think alternate tunings are cool. I think Joni Mitchell is cool. I think Soundgarden is cool. You know, I just, I, I had to impose some limitations in order to be able to like get out of bed in the morning. And this is one of them. <clears throat> All right. Here's a fun one. Um, This is from Emmanuel. This is an impossible fucking username. Emmanuel Camilo Dressrod 3405. If you had to pick one, what do you think is the most important part of a song? Is it the melody, the timbres, the chord progression, the rhythm, or maybe something else? Uh, I think it's... I think this is a dangerous way to think. You know... I think it's like dangerous to like make a checklist and then start like calculating that like, you know, if your melody is a nine, but your timbres are a five, then you just need to get the rhythm and the chord progression to be like a six and the whole thing will be okay. I, I just feel like you should try to make everything as good as it can possibly sound to you. You know, if you listen to the timbres and you think, well, that might sound better if it was a piano then like, you know what you got to do. You should make it a piano. You see what I'm saying? Um, so I would just say, like, be careful about, like, figuring out how to weight the variables, you know, because I don't think it's a computational problem. I think making a work of art is, like, not an equation. Uh, having said that, you know, one thing I'll do, this is my pledge to you, ask me anything, is that like a lot of times I'll take the question and then I'll give some answer where I'm like, it's none of those things, idiot. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'll take the question and I'll be like, wrong. <laughs> but then I'll feel bad about it and I'll say, but for the sake of answering the question, on the terms that set, I'll, I'll try to give you an answer. <laughs> so I'll try to do that now. And I guess if I had to pick one of these things, I, I don't think like, if you always tried to make the melody as good as it could possibly be, you probably do okay, you know? 
Um, if, if the melody is just dynamite, I, I think it's okay. I mean, there's a lot of songs where like a medium lyric rises to the level of a good melody. And I, I can't really think of any where like a shitty melody is okay because the lyric is smart. I, at least I don't really like music like that. And when I feel like the melody has been sort of contorted to fit the words, like when I feel like the, the melody is being pressed or is being twisted so that it can like say the verbal part of it, I usually don't like that. Whereas like, you know, I think of something like, Do You Love Me by Kiss. I like that song. And like, I don't really know why hearing Paul Stanley say like, do you love me? Like makes, do you love me a good lyric? But I think it does. Like if you told me you were working on a song and all you had was the title and the title was, do you love me? And you asked me to tell you whether I thought that was a good title or not. I'd be like, I don't fucking know. I mean, it's like, could be anything. Do you love me? I mean, there's probably already a 900 million songs that are called that. So I don't know, dude. I, I don't think Do You Love Me is like a one in a million lyric, <laughs> but something about the way Paul Stanley gets it out of his mouth, something about something about what happens to Do You Love Me on the journey through his throat. I buy it. Do you love me? I mean, like, do you really love me? You know, I just, I buy it. I don't know why. And I like that he goes from saying, do you love me? That's like the call. He like sets it up with do you love me and then the response is i mean like do you really love me <laughs> I mean, there's no rhyme <laughs> I, I don't know why but like i think that's good i like that song and i like that it's the last song on destroyer too you know i think it's cool that kiss made this record called destroyer right that's what they named it destroyer you know and the the cover is like one of the all-time great kiss album covers it's like very marvel comics it's them leaping out of this volcanic eruption it's like hardcore shit you know what i mean it's like seems pretty diabolical and then they end it with this like paul stanley romance i'm a sucker for stuff like that same with thin lizzie we were talking about them before i'm a, I'm a sucker for like these like leather jacket guys in the 70s you know acting like they're tough and then being like I, like there's something about that that kind of gets me where they're like, you know, I, I'm going to act like I'm a fighter, but don't tell anybody I'm, I might actually be a lover. That's like, there's something about that, dude. I feel like I like music like that. And Paul Stanley does it. And do you love me? Ending destroyer is that. Um, so I guess what I'm saying, he was like, there's something about the vocal delivery and the melody and the presentation that makes the lyric rise to that level. And if your melodies are just like fucking gold plated, I think it'll work. Whereas like if you focus on the timbre or the more production side, and I feel bad saying this because like a lot of what, well, actually that's not true. Like, I, so I was about to say that I spent a lot of time in my YouTube videos talking about like weird guitar tones, which is like a timbre thing and a production thing. It's like, what could you do with this guitar tone? But the reason why I cover so many songs is because like I'm, I'm trying to show how good stuff sounds when the song is cool you know what i mean like there's nothing i like more than like doing a glitchy little cover of like a dion warwick song written by burt Bacharach. you know what i mean you take material like that with fucking serious chords and serious melodies anybody who had a heart could look at me and see that i loved you you know what I mean? That's like some heartbreaker shit. And then you take that and like reinvent it with some glitchy little timbres and production shit. You know, there's a reason why I, like it sounds good. It's because it is good. But my point here is that like the reason I'm always trying to think of like cool songs like that to cover, you know, a cool Mariah Carey song, a cool Elliot Smith song, a cool song by the Crystals, a cool Phil Spector song, a cool Bruce Springsteen song. Um, I like covering the guitar shit too. And nothing makes me happier than like covering like an ACDC song and feeling like I actually kind of played it straight and got it right. 
but most of the songs I cover are more sort of like in the pop world and like the chord melody world. And I think that's because like, that's really the most important thing and, and taking dull material and using the coolest production style of all time is only going to bring it up so far. But if the melody and the material is really cool, um, I think you'll just get that much farther along. Um, I saw there's that Pat Metheny interview with Rick Beato. I, I think Rick Beato's interviews with those musicians are good, where he just like interviews the guy for two hours. That those are cool interviews. And I like that Rick Beato like gets nerdy and talks shop and like really wants to know about like how did you pick that chord? You know, I'm into that kind of stuff. At one point in the Pat Metheny interview, Pat Metheny talks about how like you know anybody who like looks up music in the encyclopedia sees that music has three components there's rhythm harmony and melody harmony meaning like the chords and you can study harmony you know that's sort of what music theory is like if you learn music theory you're, you're sort of learning about like the science of a chord or the science of a chord progression or the science of a key um you know, rhythm is like when you're playing, that's important, but you can study it. There's exercises you can do. You know, there's those Sean Driscoll videos I told you to watch. And then Pat Metheny says that melody is like the mystical one. You know, melody is the thing where it's like, who knows where it comes from or what it is. And he says that his favorite musicians of any kind are always highly melodic, but he has this like expansive view of melody. Like he says that he considers Ornette Coleman to be extremely melodic. And even though some of that shit is like atonal and chromatic, even in the chromatic realm, he's like making gestures and, and sort of like setting up expectations and then exploiting those expectations. And that's sort of what melody is to Pat Metheny. That like melody is sort of like over time, you, you sort of like begin a phrase and that phrase like is going to seem like it should be something and then you either deliver on that promise or you subvert that promise but but there's an art to that too and if you sort of don't deliver on enough promises it's like not going to be fun but if you're too predictable that's going to be boring too and that like on some level melody is just like the art of that you know like your your tension and release game is sort of the mo is like the the melodic action in its purest form and the thing i like about this is that like a drum solo could be melodic according to this logic you know what i mean i, I mean i think that's actually kind of obvious if you think about it like the great drum solos are phrases you know ringo ringo starts drum solo in the end is like phrase to phrase to phrase to phrase you know bunny carlos's drum solo and ain't that a shame by cheap trick is just phrase to phrase to phrase to phrase. That's why those drum solos are like fun to play ear drums to, you know, it's because they have this like melodic quality where it's like one sentence being spoken after the next. By the way, um, speaking of Ringo Starr, I, I think I think the drum solo in the end is my favorite solo on any instrument in any Beatles song is, is a Ringo solo. Just want to put that out there. Um so yes to answer this question I, I guess i would say that like um you know i think if we have to pick one thing i i don't like the idea that we have to pick one thing but since you asked i i would say if if you um if you picked melody i, I don't think it would like blow up in your face I don't, I don't think you would regret it um okay cool here's one um what are some of your favorite examples of acoustic playing and tone from Four Kite? Um, favorite examples of acoustic playing and tone. Okay, cool. Um, anything Pete Townsend, you know, I, I love the way that guy strummed and recorded his acoustic guitars and also the choices in the songs. I mean, there's like obvious examples like Behind Blue Eyes or Pinball Wizard, but one of my favorite Who songs of all time is called Sunrise. It's from the Who Sell Out, and it's just Pete Townsend singing and playing. It's him playing acoustic guitar and singing. That's a really cool song. I highly recommend it. I highly recommend Sunrise by the Who. Um, it, it's just really cool. It's a good example of what I consider a little song. I've talked about this before. 
A little song is one that's like the opposite of like a U2 song. It's like not an anthem. It's like not important. It's not a message. You know what I mean? It's not trying to like change the course of history. You know, uh, it's just the song about a girl and a sunrise. But it's not even even what the way I just said it makes it sound kind of more grandiose than it is. Um, but the cool thing is that if if you just start in a smaller realm, if you don't set up the thing to be the most important thing that anyone's ever heard, you, you can sort of sneak in. You know what I mean? If if like people let their defenses down because it sounds like oh this might just be sort of a quiet one. It sounds like this is the this is just Pete Townsend with an acoustic guitar. So okay there's like a defenselessness that the listener gets to. And from that defenselessness, you as the songwriter can like get in the gate and then you can like really start fucking up people's feelings. And I think this song is a good example of that. Um, but yeah, I just think Pete Townsend in general, uh, acoustic guitar, that guy's dynamite. I also like any Led Zeppelin acoustic guitar. I, I think that stuff was always recorded. Great. It was heavy you know like hey hey what can i do there's just something kind of like heavy about that acoustic guitar that's cool you know pete um jimmy page not just as a player but also as a producer i mean it's a tired point you know everybody says that i've even said it before you know you don't need me to tell you that jimmy page's work as a producer was as good as his work as a guitar player but i think the acoustic guitar is a place where that's once again obvious um any joni mitchell is cool uh i also really love elliot smith you know um there's some lo-fi vibes there some of it i think sounds better than others like there there are songs on like figure eight and pictures of you that i wish like there's a part of me that's curious to hear what it would have been like if he had more going on like it's just a bigger budget and a more production style i'm not saying that i necessarily think it would be better i just am curious sometimes Whereas a song like Needle in the Hay is so spooky and like so distilled that it's like, I wouldn't touch that one. Like Needle in the Hay is supposed to sound like that. You know, it's like got that sort of deliberately demo thing and it's so minimal. And, it, and it, the way he's like picking and the whole thing is just those like really dumb downstrokes and the chords are like so abbreviated that the whole thing just seems like this urgent message by like someone who had to say it this way. I buy that. There are times when I wish a little bit that like some of the material later got um, a little more hi-fi, but I feel weird saying that because I love Elliot Smith and I love those records and it sounds like I'm finding fault. And I, I really, if I could edit these, I would take this out. I, I don't mean to be finding fault with anything Elliot Smith ever did. I just think, um, as an acoustic guitar player, the stuff he did was amazing. Oh, someone also asked me about tunings before, and he's another guy who did cool tunings. I don't even understand what he was doing, but it was cool. And then um, uh, Michael Jackson sometimes would use acoustic guitars in a rhythmic way that I liked. Like there's acoustic guitar in black or white, but it just comes in as like a rhythmic thing. It's like not really about the voicing of the chord. I mean, w whatever voicing they did was right and good but um there's a way that like acoustic guitar is um used in the song black or white by michael jackson that is only there as like a percussion element and i think that's a cool way to think of acoustic guitar is like you put it there just to sort of um it comes and goes in that song it's only on like it only sketches out some of the changes but dun dun boom 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 and then he's out and i, I think there's something cool about that um what do you think makes glitchy effects so cool I, i've tried to address this in a couple videos i talk about this in home recording how to my home recording video um but i, I think it's basically that like if you hear something glitchy i mean some people just reject it because it sounds fucked up but if you're not someone who just rejects it there's a weirdness to it that like you have to sort of figure it out and it sort of like makes you think about it more you, you can't just sort of be like oh well, that sounds like a Sheryl crow record i know what to expect you know or like oh that sounds like a blink 182 record so i know what to expect like there's this sort of glitchy quality that sounds sort of weird where you have to be like mm, 
This could be anything. I wonder what this is that makes people lean forward. Of course, that's going to end at some point. Maybe it already ended. You know, if enough people make enough glitchy music that has enough in common, people will know what to expect and then it'll be over. So, um, you know, the real message here is to just get good at being creative and imaginative so that you're not out of work when that happens. Um, cool. All right. Uh, oh, here's what I wanted to do. All I want to do is have some fun by Cheryl Crow is stuck in the middle with you by Steve Lucero. I, I disagree. I, I disagree. I actually think the Cheryl Crow song is cooler and better. Um, for one thing, I love the playing on the Cheryl Crow song. I mean, the playing on every Cheryl Crow song is pretty good. And by pretty good, I mean flawless and great. Um, I love the playing on that, and especially the end where there's that um, that little final beautiful flurry on the either the Wurlitzer or the Rhodes. I don't know which one it is. Jeff, are you still here? Is it Wurlitzer or Rhodes on All I Want to Do? I can I never know. I feel so bad. I think it's Wurlitzer. Um, it sounds beautiful. It just sounds like little. Oh, do I still have the fucking high pitched squeal? I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. I tried to deal with it. Um, I, at this point, what are we in? Like an hour and 40 minutes? I can't deal with it at this point. We're just going to have to fucking power through the last 20 minutes here. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that it sounds like shit. Um, but here's the, here's a cool thing about All I Want to Do by Cheryl Crow. Um, that the lyrics of that song are based on a poem. What was the poet's name? I feel so bad that I don't know. He's a co-writer on the song. Oh, Bud Powell, maybe? Let me look that up. I would love if I got that right. I would love if I, if I just knew what that poet's name was. He deserves it. No, of course not. No, Bud Powell is someone completely different. That's an American jazz pianist and composer. That's embarrassing. It's just totally wrong, completely different person. Fuck me. All right, all right. Who, who am I thinking? Now I got to know. Now I got to go on Wikipedia here. Who, wrote, who was the poet that wrote the poem that all I want to do is have some fun is based on? I'm just in my whole fucking live stream is grinding to a halt. Win Cooper. That's the poet's name. Win Cooper. I thought Win Cooper was Bud Powell. Fuck me. All right. This poet named Win Cooper wrote a poem. Oh, this guy knew. That's fucking cool. You knew. Flog pours Binleus. That's amazing. You knew that? Good for you, dude. All right. You, you just you get a you get a official commendation from me. Um, that you knew who that is. That's good. Cool, cool, cool. Um, all right. Uh, what am I trying to say here? Yeah, okay. So the lyrics to All I Want to Do are written by this guy named Wink Cooper. But if you look at the words to the poem and then you look at the way Sheryl Crow sings it, there's like tiny little differences that I think are fascinating and that I love them. Oh, that's what I said. I got this one right. Definitely a word return. Okay, that's what I said. I said I think it's a word. So I got that one right. I'm sorry I forgot the fucking guy's name, but at least I got this right for once in my life. Um, oh, he taught at your college? Did you take poetry classes from him? That's cool. Are you still in touch? Um, you should give him my regards and tell him I'm sorry that I didn't know his name. Uh, if you look at the way Cheryl Crow as a singer chose when and where to alter his lyrics in order to make the melody work i just think it's so cool and so fascinating i'm like not over it every time i listen to that song i think about the little choices she makes and i think it's so cool i can't remember exactly what the original was but there are places where like like the last line of the first verse is but they're nothing like billy and me and I've always thought that was such a good last line of a first verse. But they're nothing like Billy and me because all I want to do is have some fun. That's not exactly what the line is in the poem. The line in the poem is good too. But the fact that Cheryl Crow as a singer was like, that isn't how I need to sing it. I as a singer need to sing it this way. And when it comes out of my mouth, it has to be, but they're nothing like Billy and me. It's the same as like the Paul Stanley thing. Like somehow Paul Stanley knew how to sing, do you love me? I mean, like, really love me. Like, there's this thing where the singer knows their own voice and they know their own relationship with, like, phrases that I am into. I'm, like, a geek about it. And and if you look at the original poem of All I Want to Do and then you compare it to how Sheryl Crow, like, tweaked it, it's just a master class in that. There's another thing she does. At some point in that song, 
there's the moment where like a happy couple enters the bar and in the poem that goes on longer and it's like a longer thing and like the people in the bar judge the couple and there's like more of a showdown between the couple and the people in the bar but Cheryl Crow just like ends it early on and like leaves you not knowing exactly what goes on and I think that was a cool choice too so anyway maybe Steeler's Wheel is doing shit like that that I never noticed but I really like Cheryl Crow and I really like that song um Cheryl Crow's sister was my choir teacher in seventh grade and we purposely made her cry. I still feel bad about it. That sounds pretty bad. I'm not really in a position to judge though, because um you know, I I had I had one or two teachers that we fucked with, you know. I I I know what you're describing. I'm not proud of it, but I, I sort of know what you're talking about. Um all right cool 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 what else we got to do oh yeah sorry there was a question that i was going to put in here that then i didn't put in here i got sidetracked by cheryl crow i love cheryl crow how can i look more emotional while playing guitar like feeling the music versus just playing by ty Locks. um well ty Locks, you know i think you're on the right track when you sense that the issue here is like feeling the music just playing and that the real issue isn't just trying to look more emotional. Like one way to look more emotional is to like take an acting class and get better at acting emotional. But I, I don't think that's what we should be doing here. I think um, I think the, the real issue is that like you should just try to be more emotional. And then we're just going to hope that if you can be more emotional, you'll look more emotional too. <laughs> All right, so... I have some advice about how you can be more emotional as a guitar player. Um, when you're playing rhythm, like not during a solo, for instance, <clears throat> I think the thing you want to try to get to is to like experience the ecstasy of like locking in with the drummer and having like you and the drummer both deliver the goods. You know, this is going to work better if your songs are cool. And if your songs have this sort of like exciting, urgent power to them, and they like when the verse goes to the chorus and like everybody's about to get blasted with the power of your song's highly melodic chorus, and the drummer does his thing and you do your thing, if you can sort of just like experience the oneness of you and the drummer delivering the rhythm and the intensity and like try to be overcome by that, you know, if you, if you can just feel it, like the idea here is to open yourself to feeling this thing that can happen where you sort of disappear. And the only thing that is there is like the parts, the musical parts. And like there's your part and there's the drummer's part and they're sort of like operating together. And if you can kind of just like be sensitive to how cool that is, you know, you might feel it. And if you can feel it, you might show it. Let's hope. Uh, on the lead guitar side, you know, I think the thing to get to is sort of like, the, you know, the shit I feel the most is like <clears throat> when I can barely just hear the thing I want to do. It To me, it, it sort of comes the highest version of feeling emotional, I think, is like when you improvise and it goes well, you know, like where you sort of hear the idea you maybe want to try to do. You hear it right there on stage and then you like try to grab it. And then if you grab it, that's like ecstatic, you know, like that's the Pat Metheny thing where he like he's like trying to get the idea and then he gets the idea and he gives you the idea. Like it's hard to be able to improvise that well. You know what I mean? Like I'm not saying that me and Pat Metheny are peers in this regard. <laughs> I'm not saying me and Pat Metheny are peers in any regard. Um, but I, I do, I guess I feel like I know the chase. And like, I think I've had a version of the emotional experience, you know, where it's like, oh, what if I just tried to do that? Can I do that? Let's fucking do it. And then you do it. I don't know how good your ear is. I don't know how good your sort of inner sense of melody is but like those are things to try to work on so that you can even be eligible for having this experience you know if you don't improvise ever it can be terrifying maybe you don't want to do it because it's too terrifying but if all the decisions you make as a musician are avoiding being terrified then 
you you're not going to be that emotional you know what i mean like one way to look more emotional while playing the guitar is to like take the training wheels off and do some shit that might be terrifying <clears throat> uh okay cool that's that's my answer to that um what else do i have on the pre-submitted list uh um there was one i wanted to do about like modeling i got a lot of questions about modeling uh yeah here it is it was this guy nick shreds all right here's the modeling question i'm, I'm gonna use this to sort of address all modeling issues this is not gonna fit in one thing either probably have you had much experience using amp modeling i want to improve and i'm currently stuck trying the metal prog world these programs are so popular but i worry that recording with neural dsp or bias effects is going to cause me to sound too close to other artists i think what you're talking about here is like using settings or presets or profiles that like get released and that like you know this is like what dragon force uses or whatever um and the hardcore way to get around this issue of sounding too much like dragon force is to just not use their presets and not use anybody's presets again i'm sorry if this is like the same kind of disappointing macho bullshit that i always give out you know but that is who i am um you know one way to think about this is just like floyd mayweather jr used to keep his gym like 100 degrees you know and he would spar for like four minute rounds because the real fight is three minutes. I don't even know if that's true, but I heard it and I like it. You know, I, I like that idea. Don't use any other presets. Keep your gym at 100 degrees. Force yourself to try to do it by ear. Now, if you do it by ear and it sounds like garbage and it just sounds terrible, there's two things you can do. One is, would it still sound terrible if you tried to write something to it? You know? It might sound terrible if you're trying to play Dragon Force, but listen to the terrible tone and see if you can come up with something that works for that tone. See what it makes you think of, you know? Maybe it reminds you of this new style. It's not Dragon Force at all. That could be cool, you know? Um, it's a little bit like Cheryl Crow altering the lyrics to suit her own voice, you know? see if you can do that by taking some terrible guitar sound you hate that was your failed attempt to imitate somebody and then instead of getting better at imitating them what if you just like tried to rewrite everything about your song so that it suited the shitty guitar tone you have in front of you that's one way to do it another thing you can do um is uh try to figure out how to get the sound without using the preset and then look at the preset and see what the difference is. You know, this is sort of like looking up the answer in the back of the textbook. Like sometimes it's cheating, but if you look at the answer and you look at your answer and they're different and you try to figure out what the difference is, that might help, you know? Like maybe the maybe the real version is like using less distortion but more mid-range frequencies, you know? You might learn stuff by doing it that way. But I guess I would say that um <laughs> he's talking about Cheryl Crow again. Yeah, I, I talk about Cheryl Crow a lot on these. I love Cheryl Crow. You know what I mean? Like, if you can't, <laughs> if it's not obvious to you from my work that how much I like Cheryl Crow, I wonder what you've really been listening to this whole time. Um, <clears throat> uh, best reverb on the market currently, pedal form. Like, I, I don't know, but I am in the early stages of making a video called Reverb how to be creative and and i feel like um you just stick around and subscribe to the channel when that video comes out it could probably answer a lot of your questions but also i could believe that the boss rv6 is good for the money i, I think it's rare for a boss pedal not to be good for the money you know those things the value of what they cost and what they can do boss is like a pretty pretty great value usually i don't even have a boss rv6 at the moment um but i could believe that that is a is, is a good one uh, <clears throat> um okay cool oh wait hold on did i miss something man i hate people how my people get i hate how people get my music mixed up with dragon force yeah i, I don't know who sounds like dragon force who doesn't i was just 
you know, you know what I meant, right? I was just saying like, it could be Dragon Force, but it could be anybody. Um, all right, cool. How many more of these pre-submitted questions do I have to get through? I, I don't mean for that to come out the way it did. I love doing these. Uh, but how far are we in? Oh, we're deep. We're deep. I usually try to go like a little under two hours. I'm going to do one more. Um, actually, no, I'm going to not. I'm going to do more than one more because I also got a lot of questions about this. <clears throat> Any thoughts or ideas for how to run a stereo rig would be excellent. I just got a second amp hoping to create wet dry mix and get a left right pulsating effect from a stereo flanger. This is from someone named Diesel Breakfast. Um, I got a few questions about this. So I'm using this as like a representative question. If we're talking about playing live, I think that like the benefits of a stereo rig at the club level might not be worth it. I mean, it's complicated. You know what I mean? You got to bring two amps. The sound guy's got to be up for it. You got to explain it. It's going to take longer to set up. It, it might not be worth it, and and the like, the amount of precision it's going to take to get wet, dry, wet, right for a club show. You know, it's just. Here's the other thing, is that every amp is stereo. When people hear it in a room, this is the cool thing, right? You could take a mono reverb and run it into a mono amp, and then put it on a stage and turn it on and play through it. And everybody's going to have a stereo experience when they hear it because it's going to bounce all over the room and everybody's got two ears and it's going to take two different journeys to get to everybody's two ears. So it, it's already stereo, right? The, the only thing you're getting when you go stereo with two amps and they're like across the stage is that there's like, it's more complicated. And if it works, it'll be a more complicated stereo image when they, when they're standing there. But, um, how much more complicated you know what i mean like what would sound a lot better is if like your band is tight and like you guys really figured out some good arrangements and like the bass and the guitar and the drums all sort of know how to play and when to play so that nobody's stepping on anybody else you know if people can just hear your fucking song clearly and it's a good song that's worth a lot more than like some fancy stereo image now I would say that for recording, it's worth it. Like re recording a, a stereo image out of your guitar, that that's worth it. But it's not nearly as complicated, especially if you're using like amp modeling or whatever, you know. And you don't need to do wet, dry, wet or whatever to record either. You can just like put two microphones up, one close and one far, and it's stereo. Or you can just set up a stereo reverb in a plug-in. You know, I, I think recording stereo is worth it. But live... I guess my answer is like, I doubt that it's worth the trouble. If there's anybody watching this who strongly disagrees and thinks that I'm an idiot, you know, you know what to do. Leave a comment. You know, I get those comments. So feel free to tell me I'm wrong in the comments. But I, I kind of feel like um, it, it might not be worth the trouble. That said, I, I feel like there are other smart people who are talking about this. Like on that pedal show, I think they have a whole episode dedicated to this, right? Dan and Mick. I feel like those guys would make the case for why it's cool, you know? Um, all right. Oh, yeah. This is the this is the one I wanted to end on. This is going to be my last question. Uh, how... How are musical aesthetics and tones shaped by the environment around an artist? Hawk Spring. Um, you know, I'm assuming they are. You know, like Steve Vai talks about the fact that he just assumes that the fact that he's a vegetarian is part of his guitar playing. I'm not sure he could tell you exactly how it is, you know, like the fact that he likes to... I don't think Steve Vai thinks the fact that he likes to harmonize and parallel fifths is because he doesn't eat meat but i think his point i've heard him say some version of this is um <clears throat> you know uh he is who he is he tries to play as an expression of who he is and part of who he is is that he doesn't eat meat so you know i i guess i believe some version of that um I'm not really sure how to 
so I think it's there and I think it's a big part of it, but I guess I also think it's inescapable. And I, I guess I, I think it's important just to try to make your stuff as personal as possible, you know, until the day you get hired to do something for somebody else where you got to help them do their thing. You know, if Cheryl Crow calls and asks you to like play back up on her song, maybe you sort of got to do what Cheryl Crow tells you to do. But until the day that call comes in, you know, why not just try to make your thing as you as possible? So I think if you do that, um, the the environment will just come out. I'll, I'll give you an example. I was talking before about a band I used to be in before Cyber Attack called Sweet Fix. Um, and Sweet Fix uh, was like a New York band, but we all like lived all over the place. Like I lived in Queens. Uh, the drummer was in Manhattan. Jeff was in Manhattan. The bass player was in Jersey. Singer was in Queens with me. So like we weren't all from one neighborhood and we were all coming from different places. You know, the bassist was like coming in from Jersey. He was showing up at Port Authority. And so we rehearsed in Midtown Manhattan. And, you know, you know, that we didn't, we weren't cool enough to do like the monthly rental at the music building. There's like, there's a cool Midtown rehearsal option where you like rent a room monthly and we like we were not together enough to like fucking sign a lease so we were doing hourly at like smash studios and funkadelic you know you can imagine it's just like this is like an hourly rehearsal studio in some midtown building like on top of a sparrow pizza or whatever and so every time <laughs> we had to have like a band meeting it would be in one of these like midtown deli things you know with like the all you can eat buffets and like you know pita chips and water bottles and then some like shitty table and chairs in the back and like every time we had to have a band meeting about anything it would be in these like totally midtown delicatessens that had like no vibe and like we never bumped into anybody you know we would play shows with other musicians and like make friends with other bands from playing shows but like we never bumped into people on 38th street who were like hey look who it is it's our, you know it's like hey that's from the guy from such and like that never happened and i used to wonder sometimes like how big a liability it is that like the band had no neighborhood and like no scene right like everybody always talks about the importance of belonging to a scene and i used to wonder like what does it mean about this band that our scene is like the cultural black hole of midtown manhattan you know what i mean like the 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 realm of no realm, you know, the, the place where they're like, the culture is just zero, like the absolute zero of culture. Like if there's a culture here, it's like porn stores and Seven Eleven, you know? And like, <clears throat> I used to wonder sometimes if like, we should be trying harder to like be that, like, should, should we try to be the band that is like the house band of the bathroom at Port Authority? Like that's a vibe. Like it, it might be sort of repellent, but like it's something, you know, like sh should we be trying to be a band that like you can imagine hearing play in a porn store, you know, in Times Square? Like maybe that would be more artistically rich than what we were trying to do. Now, I thought what we were trying to do was cool. I mean, the stuff is still on stream. You can listen to it for yourself. It's, the band was called Sweet Fix. You could judge it however you want. We, we, in the end, we decided not to try to be the house band at the urinals a port authority you know but like every time we would like have one of our band meetings in the midtown deli it, you know they would be like playing wplj or ktu or something and the music would it would just be like lady gaga and u2 it was just like the the music of globalism like the, the music that is just like the most successful music that's ever been made and i would go back and forth about how cool that was i was like maybe it's cool that it's like lady gaga you two and us you know what i mean like maybe we're received in this world where we're being set up to be like the third most famous successful musicians in the entire world maybe that's what's happening or maybe like i like lady gaga and you two i like them but like they're not local you know what i mean there's like there's nothing local to midtown and i used to wonder sometimes um whether like that band was taking a hit because we had like no neighborhood and, and i wondered sometimes if there was like a a sort of gap in our authenticity or something 
And if you ever hear me like talk about New Jersey or like shove New Jersey in everybody's face or like cram in all these images of malls and Six Flags and parking lots and CVS and the suburbs in my videos, if it seems like I might be overcorrecting a little bit, now you know why. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I guess my, my advice to you would be like, how are musical aesthetics and tone shaped by environment? Like, I don't really know, but I, I, I think you should like go for broke and try to use it as much as possible. You know, be as you as possible, be as much a product of your hometown as possible. And if you fucking hate your hometown and you had a traumatic childhood, then use the town you moved to, you know, but use it. I think you got to use it. And now I have to say thank you, Roscoe's Raps, um, for the seven dollars and 77 cents and the nice comment i appreciate it i would also have accepted six dollars and 66 cents 666 feel free to um make your super chat uh gifts to me the number of the beast but in all seriousness thank you roscoe's raps i appreciate it um <clears throat> all right everybody uh you know i love doing these thanks for sticking with me if there was like some high-pitched noise bullshit i apologize for that but on the other hand you know annoying noises is my whole fucking brand so, you know, I did it on purpose. Um, and, you know, that's why I named my thing Cyber Attack. So that if it sounded like shit, it would just sound like I did it on purpose. Have a good one. I'll see you next time.